Hey, hey, welcome back everyone to another broadcast of In the Trenches. I'm your host, Tom Morcus, and today I sit down with Max Kolish, who is the founder of Zinc.io. Zinc is a 15-person startup located in San Francisco, California, and they provide software solutions for e-commerce businesses. In today's conversation, we zoom in on Max's founder story, what it was like to get Zinc off the ground and to grow it into a 15-person startup in San Francisco, including how he grew it to $6 million in revenue, which is pretty remarkable considering it's only a few years old. Max's story actually starts, give or take, by applying to and getting accepted into Y Combinator, which is a very prestigious startup incubator. And so in today's conversation, we talk about what it was like for him to apply and get accepted, what the environment is like for entrepreneurs in that startup incubator environment, and how that helped propel Zinc forward. My big takeaway from today's conversation is specifically on the aspect of user acquisition and customer acquisition and how Max thinks about acquiring new customers. And they don't do it through paid ad spend, although they have spent money on advertising, but for slightly different reasons that we'll talk about in the conversation today. But how he was able to do it effectively through leveraging their existing customer base to grow their platform. And what I thought was most interesting of all was how Max highlighted as one of his major growth channels, influencer marketing, affiliate marketing, partnerships, which is something I've always been very, very big on and something that's helped me grow my businesses to multiple six figures and more and work with clients. And we've generated millions and millions from influencer marketing and leveraging the right types of referrals to the right types of audiences that we're targeting our target customer. And so it's interesting to hear how Max is doing that in this space in the and in this kind of B2B space regarding Amazon and resellers, e-commerce in general. So that was definitely my big takeaway. And I think it's some useful advice to consider if you haven't actually gotten on the influencer bandwagon or you're not connecting with people who could potentially share your product with their audience, then I think you're missing out on huge potential growth no matter what you're doing, no matter what kind of product it is. Honestly, I, I really do believe that. If you're curious to learn more about that, shoot me an email at tom at tomworkus.com. If you're curious about how you can leverage influencers and affiliates and partners to grow your reach, your influence, and your profit, I'd love to see how I can help in the same way that I've helped many of my clients achieve tremendous results from influencer and affiliate and partnership campaigns across a spectrum of industries and selling a variety of products and services. So don't hesitate. Reach out. Email me at tom at tomworkus.com if you want to know more. Just shoot me an email. Say, Tom, I want to learn more about influencer marketing. I heard you on the podcast tell me more. How do we get started? Something along those lines, and we'll make it happen. Again, that's tom at tomworkus.com. Now, without further ado, let's get to today's conversation with Max. So Max, I want to kick things off by hearing what it was like for you to apply to Y Combinator, what that process was like kind of getting into Y Combinator then and then going through that process to launch a startup. What was that like for you? Yeah. So I... Met my co-founder back in college um, at MIT. We were fraternity brothers, college brothers, and we um, kind of were working on some stuff senior year. Basically, we kind of decided to on a whim. We had heard about it. We had some older friends from college who had gone through it and had good things to say. You know, they tended to be interesting and smart people, and we looked up to them. And so we said, you know, this YC thing might make sense, um, but we didn't think we would get in by any means. We kind of just applied more or less on a whim. Luckily, we kind of had you know a couple interesting ideas for businesses that we could work on, and so we applied with those. And you know, a couple of weeks later, we heard back that we got an interview. So that was kind of exciting because most people don't get interviewed. So we flew out to San Francisco to to Palo Alto and yeah, interviewed there a couple of weeks later. Um, that was kind of a really you know stressful ten minute interview that you spend weeks preparing for. But yeah, the, the, I mean, all the partners were very nice. Um, kind of understood what we were trying to build. And, and so we got in. And luckily, we also, you know, we were both technical. So we both studied computer science and uh, were programmers. So that's something that they kind of historically preferred and also still like. Yeah, it's uh, hyper competitive from what I've heard and spoken to some people who've gone through uh, either Y Combinator or some of the other, uh, you know, we'll say, you know, tech stars, some of the other competitors, quote unquote, or just other alternatives. But I think Y Combinator still holds like one of the, you know, one of, one of the more prestigious badges of honor in in the startup ecosystem world, right? They have some some pretty remarkable success stories coming out of them. So what was it like to go through it? Especially since you were, it sounds like you were basically just out of college going into this. Yeah. A lot of the, like you said, most successful, most interesting companies in the last decade or so have gone through Y Combinator. So companies like Dropbox and Reddit, Stripe, Airbnb, um, you know, some newer ones like Instacart. 
we're all uh, Y Combinator alums. And so they have a pretty solid reputation in, in the great network and things like that. So going through was, I think, immensely valuable for us. We were you know, pretty young. We had some idea of what we wanted to do, but we had no real experience running a startup and um, kind of just played it by ear. It was really helpful to talk to people who had years of experience who had seen this all, you know, the same things hundreds of times before and get their take on, on problems that we were having. It was pretty formative, even, even more so than the advice, the pace at which they expect you to work at and to progress at is, is incredibly quick. And so I used to, you know, we worked hard, obviously at, at MIT and things like that, but during my combinator, it was all, all work pretty much all the time. And, uh, you know, their, their kind of goal is 7% week on week growth. After you pick your metric, you kind of want to continue growing that metric 7% every week. And so that is a pretty lofty target, especially once you start getting into higher numbers. So that was that was kind of the the goal each week. And you would go in on you know Tuesdays, you'd have office hours with a set of partners and also a couple other companies uh, that were kind of working on similar in a similar space as you. And you'd go around, talk about your problems. It was kind of like a group startup therapy session. And that was also really encouraging because you see all these other world-class entrepreneurs who are we're working on stuff and you know some of them are really succeeding a lot which causes you to work really hard and some of them you know you're just like oh these people have problems just like us <laughs> the same kind of problems so um makes you like a little bit more grounded in reality there um and, and realize that not, your problems are not all unique to you um so for us it was you know it was a really amazing experience and then the, the last piece was also the demo day at the end of the uh, batch is something YC does a great job of putting together a lot of investors who are really excited about investing in these new companies and so you know, they compete for, for the best deals and, and usually fundraising is really hard for companies and companies kind of have to try to talk to a lot of investors. YC makes it about as easy as possible because they set up this competitive environment for the investors. And so um, that was really helpful for us. We, we didn't raise too much money, but we raised a small seed round. And as a result, we were able to basically, you know, continue working on the company for years to come after that. And just to clarify, that was, was that Zinc? Oh, that's right. That was Zinc. Yeah. Okay. So that you actually, that was when you applied to Y Combinator, that was with that, that idea in mind with what Zinc.io currently is. Is that correct? Did you give or take? I'm sure it's, it's, uh, turned out differently than maybe what you were planning to some degree. And we could talk a little bit about that, but was that the intention going into was to build that specific company? Um, no, we actually changed the idea around quite a bit. Um, that was the other thing that YC helped with is kind mm. of rapidly iter- iterating and working on new things. Um, it wasn't just the, the thing that we started on initially. In fact, that actually ended up not working. And so we had to do it a couple of times in YC. And I can talk a little bit more about that if you're interested. I am actually. Yeah, I wanted to kind of zoom in on there because you, you you said something that I thought was kind of interesting. It kind of so- sounded arbitrary, but I'm sure it's not. The idea of 7% growth week over week, uh, picking a metric and then sticking to that. Uh, so I guess first, why 7%? And then maybe let's zoom into your uh, use case scenario of going through it. What was that for you guys in the beginning? Obviously, it, maybe it didn't pan out or something didn't work well enough. I don't know if it was that that you weren't hitting that specific metric or that goal, but you shifted. You said you pivoted. You changed it around a, a couple times. So That's right. maybe zoom in on the, the philosophy behind the 7% and then also how that impacted what you guys were doing. Yeah. So I don't know exactly why it's 7%. I'm tempted to say, I mean, 7% week on week is roughly 30% month over month growth, which is just a really good pace for a startup in its first you know, six months of, of kind of especially pre-seed, um, kind of when you're at smaller numbers, those are you know doable metrics. And so that, that's kind of what investors just use as a benchmark. There's no particular reason, I think, specifically for having that number. For us, when we entered, it was actually uh, with an idea to do an enterprise product. We were kind of doing affiliates, basically allowing affiliate marketers or publishers to create a one-click checkout on their website. And so we were working on that. And we ended up pivoting away from that because we couldn't close this one big deal that we were working through. So... Halfway through, we said, okay, what's going to allow us to achieve this growth by demo day? And so we actually launched a consumer product, which was a browser extension for saving money when shopping online. And so the um, growth metric for that one was basically users, um, or I think we might have used orders orders per day. And so that was the number that we were trying to maximize. So each week, we tried to, you know, what growth tactics can we do today? What can we build to allow more users you know, to, to use our product? And uh, we did grow pretty aggressively towards demo day. And, you know, you met and exceeded all of our metrics, ended up raising some money as a result of that. Um, unfortunately, like a month after y-, y Combinator ended, we got a cease and desist from Amazon, uh, which we weren't ready to fight at the time because, mm-hmm. you know, we were just, you know, we were two people and we didn't have the resources really. So we ended up shutting down that product. But I still think it's a, it's a good product idea. And uh, <laughs> there, could, there could be room for something like that in the future. Um, but it took us a while after that to, to kind of iterate on the product, hone in on stuff and, and finally come to the products that we're working on now. Um, 
which has seen a lot of growth, like Joe Lister and Price Act and some of these others. Awesome. Yeah, I want to get into that in a second. But first, I want to zoom in on this piece. So when you approach this and, and you're in this space where this is this is what Y Combinator is all about, you know, the intention behind it, right, is to create successful, profitable companies, maybe not all unicorns, but at the end of the day, like that's what it's, it's an ecosystem or a, uh, an environment to produce profitable companies with a lot of potential scale, right? That's right. So you're surrounded by that. The expectations are very high. It sounds like it's very demanding. And they obviously, you know, give you insight and advice and uh, to some degree, like, like on, on where to go, what to what to do, uh, not necessarily what to do. I'm guessing that's probably something you have to figure out. But there's, I, I believe, there's some some aspect of mentorship here, right? With Y Combinator as you go through it. Now, you guys came Certainly, in, with the, yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that it's actually a little bit lower touch than you would expect. I think a lot of people, okay. you know, think about YC and 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 um, if you don't know too much about it, you might think, okay, these are these guys are helping you day to day. They're kind of like helping you make the decisions in your company. YC gets you know a lot of really good people, and so what they have the privilege of doing is kind of stepping back and saying, hey, we you know, let you run the show and we're here if you need us. And so they're very kind of, um, you know, they'll do some stuff proactively, but largely as a resource, they're, they're very reactive. So if you ever need help, uh, if you ever have an urgent issue or need, you know, to get in touch with somebody at a particular company or like some specific request like that, or just general advice, general, you know, you know, you come to them with questions that apply to your startup, they can kind of um, use their knowledge to, you know, to either come up with an answer themselves or, or find somebody who knows the answer or, or can at least guide you in the right direction. And so it's a very, you have to be pretty proactive as a, you know, founder going through YC, you have to ask a lot of questions. That's what I tell people now when they apply and they expect it to be super hands-on and uh, luckily it isn't because you want to spend most of the time just working on your company building your product talking to your users and and not much else really so it's useful that they kind of keep this low touch environment yeah that is kind of interesting and so just so i can kind of get a snapshot because i I was curious about this i actually considered uh, applying to one of these uh, years past but then i got to the point where i was like ah you know this thing i'm doing bootstrapped i don't know if i'd want to take investor money i think there's pros and cons to it like obviously there's some major pros and i I get that but i just got to the point where i'm like i'm too beyond that with where i'm going and, and what i'm doing and i'm very happy with being bootstrapped and and owning uh, what I've created, you know, completely, which again is not to discount the idea of getting seed funding or being, uh, you know, working with an investor and, and getting that money uh, from them to help blow it up. That's an experience I've, I've never had, and so I think it's kind of interesting to hear like what it takes, what people invest in. And so in this context, I have kind of two questions about this. One is in that environment, then is it like everybody's in the same like building, and are you encouraged to collaborate with other? other business owners going through Y Combinator? And I'll just start with that one. And then I'll have my second question in a second. Yeah, uh, you're not in the same building. You there's, there's meetings. Um, you know, there's there's like two hours a week of planned activities. Um, one is kind of a dinner, or I guess not two hours, maybe four hours, but two events. One is one is the group office hours that I mentioned earlier. And another one is the uh, kind of a dinner, which is more inspirational, where everybody comes and they feed you dinner. And it's, uh, they'll, they'll have like a speaker who's an alumni or some other prominent entrepreneur come and talk and, and answer questions afterwards. And then we'll do a panel on you know a particular subject, growth, whatever it might be. And so there's really little scheduled programming. Uh, people are encouraged to live in Palo Alto or Mountain View, but you're encouraged to kind of work out of your house, which is how well, most successful startups start. Is just you're sleeping and working in the same place, um, just to, to minimize friction of, of going to you know to another place. So there's really little kind of uh, programming on that front. Okay, got it. And that helps uh, me understand a little bit better. So, okay, so that's the context. You come in there, you you know, they do th- bring you guys together for certain uh, events and and things like that. There is some some aspect of mentorship, but really, it's like you're there. You got to perform. You kind of want to show up every week with some kind of progress being made. I'm sure it's like very much a personal driven affair as much as is anything else, like in terms of external expectations. Is that about right? That's about right. Yes, it's it's very driven by you. Yeah, and so I, I have a couple questions. So. This idea of okay, so this the seven percent, we'll we'll go with it. It, it kind of makes sense uh, in terms of like thirty percent. I get it. I, I'm I'm sure that that is something investors would want to see. How do you decide which metric that you're gonna you're you're going to measure? How do you determine that KPI or or whatever it is that you're gonna focus on? Because and and let me preface that by saying, I guess the reason I'm asking that question is, I feel like so many metrics could be vanity metrics besides say like cash flow, but that's not. I know that's not the typical scenario in especially in like the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem. So how did you guys define your the metrics you wanted to focus on for that 7%? And again, what 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 was like the feedback or advice in terms of choosing something like that? Yeah, there's two points here. One is that the metric the metric matters a lot, but at the same time it's valuable to just have anything as a metric. Not necessarily anything, but something close to your target as a metric. It's better than having no metric, right? Um even though you know there are vanity metrics, you know number of users, number of whatever clicks, things like that. 
um, that might not be directly tied to revenue and you kind of can loosely tie it uh, to, rev- you know, to revenue later and directly or in the future or something like that. It's obviously not as not as good as revenue um, and not as good, like you said, as profitability, but it's still useful to have a North Star, something that you attach yourself to on a daily basis. You can look at this number and uh, you know, feel good when it goes up and feel bad when it goes down. And then, you know, kind of <laughs> it helps you orient yourself around your startup very, very closely, very instantly. So that's kind of the first point. Uh, the second point is, yeah, I strongly prefer metrics that are as closely tied to revenue as possible. I guess so. the reason revenue is an okay metric and not necessarily profitability is that because for a lot of most YC businesses historically have been like software businesses, right? For software, the idea is that your margins can be really large. And so if you're not profitable, you're usually reinvesting in growth of the product and building out some kind of moat, that sort of thing. It's not really, you know, you don't have to optimize for profitability early on. That being said, if you're like an e-commerce company, right? Your unit economics obviously matter a lot. You want to be profitable on a per unit basis, right? Even though you're investing some of that in you know, your engineers who are building the product, but if you have to, you know, pay $2 to acquire a user who's going to spend a dollar on your website, that's not good. You can't just count, you know, that $1 is revenue. Uh, no, no savvy investor is going to look at that and, and think highly of that. But I think historically, just because of the software businesses and a lot, a lot of these tech businesses are really high, high margin, revenue is a good proximity for profitability. And the profitability is more of a lever that you can pull. If you want to, you know, increase profitability, you can kind of tone down your you know, reinvesting in the company, hiring, whatever it might be. Or if you just want to maximize for growth, you know, like Amazon for the past 25 years, you can reinvent the, reinvest that all into, you know, CapEx and hiring and, and growing and expanding. So that's why I think revenue is a pretty, is a pretty good measure. Revenue is probably the best metric for, for most businesses. And then rarely there might be reasons for there to be other metrics. Got it. What I like about it conceptually is that even though I, I and this is obviously the, the, the fear or, or the, the challenge behind kind of arbitrarily picking a metric, and it's, I, I suppose, fear is probably the wrong word because the person choosing it is, well, maybe they are fearful, but, but this idea of choosing a metric and then it, beca- and it being a vanity metric, it's like, okay, you know, user growth, like, is that, is that, you know, a bottom line income earner or will it be in the future or, or is it not? But, and, and so that's, you know, I think it's that's so dependent on the business and kind of the aim and the focus that I, I don't want to go too much into that. But I think the idea of having a a thing that you're measuring week over week that isn't necessarily revenue seems actually really useful though for anybody who's doing any kind of work because revenue sometimes is tough to control, right? Revenue is like or profit to some degree. I kind of look at it as like it's the the output, but I don't control the output. I control the input. And so what can I put in and what can I focus on? What can I, what can I actually, you know, what, what are the terms that I can dictate? What can I do? And, and so there's, I don't know, there's some gray area here because you could also say, well, users, you can't force users onto a platform, but like maybe there are activities that you could do each day, each week, each month to grow, grow the business, even if it doesn't mean money right now. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or wanted to expand on an idea like that. And then we could, and then I'd like to segue into what you're doing with Zinc.io, Joe Lister, and, and some of these other projects. Sure. I think, like I said, there are, there are definitely, definitely reasons to use non-revenue metrics, right? Depending on the company. It really, it really varies. And, you know, if you come to me with a specific company, I can probably tell you what the metric should be or what, you know, if your metric is a good one. Um, but generalizing is a little bit tough. So I would, I would mm-hmm. preface this by saying it's a case by case basis. Revenue tends to be the best one. But for a lot of businesses, you know, for companies like, like consumer, you know, network companies like, like Twitter or Facebook or, or, Quora or, you know, Reddit, like those companies were always valued, you know, historically before they started running ads and developing that platform as, you know, as, as largely on their users, on their engagement, on things like that. Um, because there's always been this implicit, you know, kind of understanding that if you grow big enough, you can you can monetize it via advertising, you can monetize it via other ways. Some companies have struggled with that, obviously, which is the risk of using that metric in the first place. But you can't say that they're like doing poorly to, to be doing that for a year or two. So there are those cases where you're saying, okay, maybe this will, you know, for for a year, our metric will be this user growth. And then by that point, we expect to get this user growth, which will allow us to bring in this much revenue based on these calculations. You can do some sort of thing like that. Obviously, again, it's further away from revenue and there's more, you know, ifs in that statement. So it's a little bit tougher to, you know, to convince yourself and convince investors and, and, and whoever else that what you're doing is correct there. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And I guess I'm zooming in and thinking about like the, the solopreneur, the person who's like working on their own project right now or small teams. And 
you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where, uh, yeah, for sure, nothing beats, <laughs> nothing beats profit. That's the real deal. That's the thing that's provable and, and legit for sure. But I also think it's something to be said where I, I like the idea of say, these are the things that we're going to do each day or each week that we're going to focus on. These are our inputs um, because we know if we do these well enough, that these other things will come. So it'll be like, instead of say revenue or profit, we're focusing on like, let's, uh, you know, scheduling consultation calls or whatever, or demos or something like that, where it's like, if you do it, you know, and, and eventually you're going to find out there's going to be some kind of percentage conversion rate on those, et cetera, et cetera. It seems more controllable to a degree. And yeah. that's like useful for somebody. I think for those who are like actually really struggling to, to grow or to get to a point where it's even sustainable for themselves on a, if from a small business standpoint, even if like the people who are listening aren't, aren't trying to build like a unicorn or anything like that. They're just trying to build like a profitable, small online business or, or just a profitable business for themselves, that kind of thing. I still think it's like worth thinking about, well, if there was like one or two things you could do each day, like what would those things be? That would be like the baseline. And then of course, there's going to be a million other things you have to do. But it's like, what's the one or two things you could do every day? I want to swing that over to now what you're working on with the... It sounds like multiple companies that you founded or co-founded and that you're working on. So maybe we can kind of zoom in with the companies you own or operate or you founded now that you're currently active with. Maybe you can kind of zoom in because I know one of these, Zinc.io, it's a 15-person startup in San Francisco. So you guys are doing something right to be at that level. So I'm kind of curious how you approach that from a perspective of actually growing something now. Hey, this is in the real world. We're not experimenting anymore. You know, people's lives, uh, you know, from a from a financial uh, standpoint, are are on the line there. You know, so what do you guys do? What do you zoom in on, and what do you care about on a day to day? Yeah. So for context, the company is is Inc.io. That's the same company we've been working on for for over five years. And within that company, we have multiple products. We have a few just software SaaS products, uh, Priceyac and Joe Lister, and then we have an enterprise product as well as some other stuff that we're that we're working on and, <laughs> and cooking up. Um, but the the main revenue drivers right now are, are Priceyac and Joe Lister, and so I'll talk mostly about um, those. Primarily Joe Lister. So Joe Lister is a multi-channel selling tool for Amazon sellers to be able to cross list really easily to eBay. So we kind of there's a lot of multi-channel selling tools out there. We're the simplest one to use where with just one click, basically you can move all your Amazon inventory over to eBay. So that's a lot of what I do day to day. And we, as far as, far as your question about what do we, what do we look at? I mean, it, it goes back to what we were talking about. For, for us now, we can look very closely at revenue because we do have revenue. Profitability is something we, we, we look at now as well. And just because you know there's that top level metric of revenue doesn't mean we don't also look at a lot of other specific things, right? So we also pay a lot of attention to you know the number of trials that are starting each week, the number of trials that are converting, you know things like how many you know <laughs> how many blog posts we're putting out and what the traffic from those is looking like. Um, we kind of break it down and, and see where we want to improve. And then we, we figure out what the metrics are that we should track for that. And then we kind of grind around those. Um, and those can change over time. For example, if we have an, a big initiative to... you know, Recently, we, we um, had a big initiative to, to make our onboarding process a lot easier. And so we were looking at conversion rates between different steps of the onboarding process as like our primary metric for, for that project. right? So things like that, you know, you can still break down that that high level metric into uh, multiple uh, specifics, like you said, of, of things that are actually actionable. But it took us a while to get here to answer your question more directly. It took us a while to get here, and um, we've always been on the conservative side as far as you know, making sure we're profitable, making sure we can make ends meet, and we're not burning through cash. So that's that's been super important to us, and luckily we've been able to maintain that. Yeah, that's that's kind of how we handle the the livelihood question. Um, luckily, we we mm -hmm. you know when we uh, hire new employees, we can tell them, hey, we've been profitable for years. We're not you know you don't have to worry about having to find another job in six months, uh, things like that. If I'm understanding correctly, you guys are at a point of profitability, like or organic self sustaining profitability with uh, with Zinc .io, not 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 dependent on outside investors. That's right. That's right. That's right. We actually never raised after the initial seed round that we did after YC. Oh, awesome. Okay. Interesting. So that's, you know, again, I was going to, you know, kind of curious about that, like Y Combinator 2 and just being tapped into that ecosystem. It sounds like, or it would, would have seemed like to me, one of the benefits is the ability to get in touch with investors. Uh, I would think better than say a guy like me, who's not in that area would be able to, and, and the relationships and stuff like that that you form, but you didn't even you didn't even need it. So tell me a little bit about what, what it was like for you getting it off the ground. And that was what, four years ago now? And, and, and what that's yeah. been like, what, what that was like in the early, we'll say early days, um, kind of bootstrapping this thing effectively. The early days were basically a lot of grinding, a lot of figuring stuff out, working really quickly through different products, um, different ideas, testing them out, experimenting, 
I guess after that whole, I mean, where I left off earlier, after Zinc say we got a season decision, we kind of spent a couple of months figuring out what would be our next thing. And we, you know, tried a bunch of different projects. Some of them failed, some of them kind of kind of worked, but we didn't want to pursue. And then uh, Priceyac was actually the first thing that we started making a little bit of money on. And the way that hap- came about was we, you know, we had this API, we had this technology for automatically placing orders and we were trying to sell it, but we thought, hey, you know, this is too technical. And a lot of the people that actually want to use it are not technical. And one of those people who had emailed us and was like, hey, I want you guys to build something around this API for me. I can't build it myself. We ended up building a basic version for that person and he ended up being our first customer. The reason we kind of focused on it was he committed money up front. We, we basically just gave him a quote. We said, you know, 3000 bucks a month. Um, if you commit to a year or something along those lines, um, just to make sure that it's like a product that was worth it uh, to that to that buyer, and um, he agreed. So we we built it out. It took us a few weeks to to build out a basic prototype, and then we started. You know, we had a paying customer there, and then you know we really didn't even think that was going to be a big product until a couple months later when we got you know we had more requests coming in for the same thing, and so we we started adding new users to that, and it kind of you know took off from there. And since then, like expanding into the new product lines, like Joe Lister was something that came about because of either a customer request or you know something that we saw a clear need for. I can get into the origin story of that. We had some help from from mentors and and that sort of thing. But usually, it was we always look for somebody who can pay upfront for us building something for them, just because we've seen that as a really good you know like a uh, good predictive factor of them actually finding use in this product. We don't want to build something, spend, you know, months investing into it just to find out that nobody actually needs this or nobody actually wants this, or there's just something that's close enough and good enough for people to use. And the best way to make sure that's not the case is get somebody to commit some money and uh, be on the hook for using it. Yeah, that's actually what's going to be one of my other questions was on the uh, product development side. So I love that idea of pre-selling it first, getting somebody invested in it to begin with to kind of, kind of put down that seed money, so to speak, to, to develop it almost is one way to think about it. But then also, you have to obviously do some analysis and whatever that process is for you guys to say, hey, this is worth building beyond this one client or this one customer because we think it'll be... you know applicable to a bunch of our other customers and clients and things like that. So I'm curious, when it comes to, say, kicking off a new uh, feature or a new product, uh, when you, you know, again, that f- first piece is, is great advice. Like if you can get that first client, that first customer to, to provide that kind of seed funding, so to speak, to develop it out. But what else do you think about or how do you do the analysis to say, yeah, this kind of feature is worth building beyond just this one paying customer? How do you decide if it's worthwhile to actually build it out and say, yeah, this is worth our time and energy, or do you, is it just is it just a guess? And then you try to you know sell it, sell it later, or maybe there's somewhere in between. It depends on your priorities, and there's a ton of answers to this question, right? I mean, the easy thing is, okay, we have this one customer now. Are there other people that might want to use it? Usually, uh, my co-founder loves to say it's like very unlikely that only one person in the world has this problem, right? If one person in the world has this problem, it's likely that some number of other people have it. Like one is a very Unlikely, <laughs> unlikely number of people to have a certain issue. Um, so we assume, okay, there might be other people. How do we find them? Can we ask them if if this is a problem for them? And you know, will will we'll they answer us truthfully? So I think the the big advantage is that we also had the product at that point. Right after the first customer, we already have a product. It's not like we're selling air to people. It's not like we're just oh, let me run this survey to see if people are interested. No, we have something that they can like see, feel, and use maybe even a little bit. And uh, that kind of helps a lot. And I should preface this, I guess, with the fact that the, the money isn't, you know, it depends on how you want to approach it. But for us, it wasn't necessarily about, okay, we need this $3,000 to, you know, to survive, to make our next move. It's like, we got to hop on this customer. We were, you know, privileged enough to have the, the YC money and, and, you know, some savings and things like that. So it wasn't that we were trying to get, you know, as quickly as possible to any paying customer, regardless of what it was. It was more about looking for a real use case that somebody wanted to pay money for. I think the paying the money is more important than us receiving the money. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. The, the, somebody who's willing to pay that much, it's like, okay, we're really, we really stumbled on something here that, that's, a, that's a big... Um, and I, w- I will also say, I didn't mention this. I think I briefly mentioned this, but just, I, I think it's an important note. I think we had a huge advantage that both me and my co-founder were over technical and, and could code and, and build stuff pretty quickly. That's just like a, such an enormous leg up when it comes to at least these sorts of products. Just iterating quickly, being able to kind of wow somebody. Like I've seen a lot of people who, who you know, they're like, "Oh, can you build this feature?" And then having it out the next day, or you know, it wows people. And I think that's really valuable in the early stages of a startup. Uh, YC kind of wisdom is that you want to have at least one technical co-founder if you're, especially if you're a technical product, ideally more. So it really is kind of valuable. And I will say that those skills are not super difficult to pick up. 
I mean, you obviously have to put in the time and the effort, but it's not like you, you know, anybody you can't do it. I think most people can learn how to code, how to build up a simple website, build up a simple, you know, back end. It's learnable. You just have to put in the, the time and the energy. Um, and I think that gives you just a huge leg up if you're trying to start a software company as opposed to, you know, hiring somebody externally or trying to do a lot of this kind of business development work before um, actually launching. I think there's just a huge, you save so much time by, by building out something basic, seeing if it works, throwing it away. Um, that sort of thing that helped us a lot. At least. Yeah, no, that's, that's great advice. And I, we could cut, probably go down a whole rabbit hole about hiring and partners and stuff like that. But I wanted to actually zoom in on, on one of our, probably one of the final questions here, uh, which is around how you've actually grown Joe Lister. And I, I, one of the things you had mentioned offline was that you guys have gotten tens of thousands of sellers using Joe Lister with almost no paid acquisition. So talk to me a little bit about what's, what has been like? What has worked for you in terms of growth of getting and acquiring, you know, new users for a platform like that? What has worked for you guys, and how do you how do you figure that out? Yeah, it's a combination of things. So the first kind of trick or secret that was nice or advantage, I should say, that we had early on was this Amazon seller named Skip McGrath, who has a newsletter who we actually worked with on the early version of Joe Lister. He was an early customer. He said, "Hey, I think there's a need for you know these kind of features to, to look like this." And I'll help you guys out by like sending it out to my newsletter. That was actually super instrumental. I think we got, you know, maybe a hundred or 150 paying customers from that alone, um, which was like a huge head start and kind of uh, set the ball rolling there. So that was a big thing, kind of, you know, working with influencers in the space. I think, yeah, influencer marketing is something that everybody's familiar with, but specifically for particular niches for products like this, I think we had an advantage because I think our software, our software was truly better than a lot of other kind of players in the space. And so, we, you know, reached out to a couple of people. They said, "Oh, this is actually great. This works. Let me like tell all my subscribers about it." Um, the the additional component there is we we did a referral program. So we had uh, we still have I think it's a fifty dollar referral. If you're if you're a paying customer, you refer somebody who you know who also becomes a paying customer. They get fifty dollars. Uh, or sorry, you get you get fifty dollars of credit for for that referral. Um, so that uh, creates this passive um, collection of people who are, you know, YouTubers or bloggers or newsletter writers uh, who are writing about your product. I think the prerequisite to all this is that your product has to be good and they have to actually enjoy it, right? The nice thing about doing referrals as a credit to uh, your product or credit for your product as opposed to just a cash is because it's self selects for the kind of people who are referring your product, right? The people that we want referring Joe Lister are the people who are actually using Joe Lister a lot and who really enjoy it. And who want to tell their friends about it? Um, I think, like in e-commerce, I don't know how familiar you are with you know particular e-commerce and, and and the multi-channel space, but there's a lot of kind of you know spammy you know in, kind of networks and, and blogs and things like that that we didn't really want to get involved with. And those are the kind of people that you start dealing with if you you just pay out cash, right? So the nice thing about like Skip and the other people we worked with is that you know we're we're giving them. Uh, invoice credits. So he's, you know, he's using Joe Lister. He's happy. He's getting it for free for a certain number of months or years in his case. And so it's, it's really, it kind of aligns inside of a lot and self selects for the people who are referring your product to actually be real, real advocates of it. So that worked really well for us. I, I think those are the two main things. And then, I mean, regarding paid acquisition, we, it's not like we ran no ads. We, we do run some ads, but we spend a pretty small amount, maybe a few thousand dollars a month on, on advertising. It's not, it's not a priority, but it's something we like to keep. And if you're familiar with, with advertising, there's a, there is a kind of decreasing return as you invest more and more money in it, right? You, set, you end up saturating the market, driving up the prices for different keywords and things like that. So there is an advantage to having some baseline of, of advertising that's non-zero because you might be missing out on really low hanging fruit. In our case, we were also, you know, we had competitors who were running against our keywords that we were losing to, which was kind of, you know, if you Google for our name, you'll, you'll see a competitor's name and, and an ad. Um, and we were like, we don't really want that. So there's kind of some baseline level of spend that we like to do for for those reasons. But outside of that, I think, you know, we've, we did some outreach. We, we did some marketing as far as like posting on Reddit forums and, um, you know, Quora and, and wherever else answering questions with people. Cause a lot of people had this problem, you know, people, people are already selling on Amazon. They're like, do I really have to like manually copy my, my listings over to eBay? Do I have to, you know, why, why won't this other software sync my prices frequently enough? I want to sync my inventory. I, I made a double sale. Like what's up with that? And so all of those we could go to, I didn't, you know, find people who are having those problems and say, here, here's the solution. And that kind of helped us hone our marketing on their, on our landing page and their language there as well. So it's a combination of all those things. I think that's, I, I don't think I'm missing anything in particular. So it wasn't like there's, there's any crazy secrets there. Oh, that's great. And as far as like next steps for you guys, like where, where is your eye right now? Like, what are you focused on? What are you looking at in terms of growth or expansion or, or maybe it's neither of those two questions right now. I'm just kind of curious, where does it go from here for you? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And Joe Lister is growing. Um, we hired a product manager for it recently, a few months ago, who who is uh, taking over a lot of that the initiative there, which which has been awesome. And I think improving the uh, product. I think is, is always a core focus for us. So um, repricing is something that we added recently. We're constantly adding new um, kind of Amazon locales and eBay locales. So features um, that, that customers request and that we think are, you know, expand the potential user base, we're always adding. Beyond that, you know, there's, uh, we're working on other products as well. I think is, you know, we're always developing new things, um, which is kind of cool because there's really interesting synergies. We know a lot of Amazon sellers at this point. We know a lot of eBay sellers. We know a lot of brands. Um, we work with a lot of larger retailers as well. And so we have all these different relationships that we keep seeing new ways to uh, leverage in interesting ways. And so that's a, that's a big priority for us too, is, is what can we do that connects all of those together and leverages them in a way that benefits kind of everybody in the whole ecosystem for us. So that's, that's our focus. I love it. Well, Max, uh, this has been really insightful and really interesting. If people are interested in connecting with you or learning more about you or checking out these products that you guys offer, what's the best way to get in contact you, with you or, or reach out and find out what you guys are working on? Yeah, the best way to find me is uh, max at zinc.io, max at joelister.com also works. So you can email me there if you have any questions. Always happy to help you know, aspiring entrepreneurs and, and um, happy to connect, especially if we can be helpful in particular if you're working on e-commerce. If you're a seller, we'd love to we'd love for you to check out the product. That's joelister.com, J-O-E, lister.com. Yeah, get in touch. Awesome. Well, Max, thank you so much for being on In the Trenches, man. It was a real pleasure. Yeah, this was awesome. Thanks a lot, Tom. Are you trying to grow your online business, but struggling to get new customers consistently and predictably? Are you tired of working nonstop only to see your income plateau? Are you ready to step off the hustle hamster wheel, as I call it, and step onto a path of predictable profit that you can scale as much or as little as you want? Don't worry, you're not alone. I've been there. When I first got started, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. So I started reading blogs and listening to podcasts by people I respected and wanted to learn from. I slowly but surely put their recommendations into practice. But because I wanted to do it all myself, maybe you you're something like that, right? And you love to do, do it by yourself, learn through trial and error. Well, bottom line is it took forever. Results were unpredictable when I was first getting started. I wasn't sure where to spend my time, money, and energy. And shiny penny syndrome got the best of me on more than one occasion. For many entrepreneurs, the amount I sacrificed, working literally nonstop in some cases in my spare time, and 12 and 14-hour days routinely after going full-time, combined with the endless fog of war, aka that uncertainty, that I had to deal with at all times because I was going it alone. I think that would have been enough for most entrepreneurs to throw in the towel. But I was persistent, focused, and I stayed humble. Day after day, I worked to grow the traffic to my website, increase my list of subscribers, and generate a healthy living for my eBooks, eCourses, and other digital products. At least that was the goal. But maybe more important than the work was that I paid attention to what I was doing, including what worked and what didn't. Eventually, I discovered a predictable pattern of growth. And so what I did was I just doubled down on those things, and I scrapped or sidelined the other things that weren't working so well. Finally, two years after resigning my commission as a captain in the army and going full-time on my online business front with my blog, with my podcast, etc., I replaced my income with digital product income. Two years. And so if that's where it stopped, I would have been happy with it. I would have been happy with the results. I wouldn't have complained. I would have been very content just replacing my income. But the bottom line is it was so much work. I wanted to you know, see if it could go somewhere else, right? So I just kept doing what I was doing, but better, faster, and more effectively. Again, just kind of applying the same system that I discovered uh, from seeing these patterns emerge, right? So I implemented it. I kept doing it. And eventually, replacing my income turned into doubling my income. And then that turned into a little bit more and a little bit more. But not just that. It afforded me the freedom to dictate my day and also choose the projects I want to work on on the schedule and on the timeline I want, and to work with the people I want to work with. And to me, that's like a whole new level of freedom, especially coming from the military. It's something I've never really had that level of complete autonomy until I became my own boss. I started my own business. And until ultimately, until it became profitable enough for me to start to take a step back and actually reap the rewards of it, because it's not all just working, working, working. And I do believe it's hard work. And I'll always say that nothing about doing this stuff is easy. But at the same time, you've got to reap the rewards at some point and take some of that profit, uh, even if you're just reinvesting it into new assets and things like that. Bottom line is, it can't just be work, right? Entrepreneurship and business is about that result that occurs, the value you've created 
and the profit, that that piece of value that you've captured, okay? And you want to be able to reap the rewards of that profit, of that value, that little sliver of value that you get to capture, that you get to net, right? You want to be able to take advantage of that. Otherwise, you know, the entrepreneurship game really does become just a grind. And, and for, I think, a lot of entrepreneurs, unfortunately, it becomes meaningless, and that's when they quit. Well, for me, I love this stuff. I really, truly do. I mean, it is my thing. And so that's why I didn't just stop where I was at. I've stayed committed to learning everything I can about all aspects of this online business world and this online marketing world. And I do this through real world application. In other words, I'm currently growing several online businesses and I'm always putting my ideas to the test in real time with my own money, with my own time and energy, oftentimes with employees, you know, a lot of some, some stuff more advanced, some stuff more simple, but you know, so varying levels of complexity and again, in different spaces, different niches. And I can say, you know, bottom line, I've always loved the startup hustle, but I got to say, it's nice to now be in a position where I can get big results with much less effort, thanks to having built the foundation of my business the right way. And again, I did it all through trial and error, but I don't think that that's the way that everyone needs to do it. And in fact, looking back on it, if I had to redo it, I don't know if I would. It was so difficult to just go it alone and try to figure everything out by myself. So one of the things I've tried to do is give back with this podcast, with my blog, and with my newsletter. But maybe even more rewarding than any of this stuff, while I've enjoyed all of it, I think the thing that I'm enjoying the most, that I find most engaging and rewarding, is the premium business mastermind and coaching program I run called 100K Academy. Inside 100K Academy, I help ambitious entrepreneurs who are very driven and excited to be doing what they're doing. I help them grow their reach, their influence, and their profit using my proprietary marketing system. That's the same one I use to scale my own online businesses from zero to multiple six figures and beyond, and the same system I use to help my clients reach the New York Times, Wall Street Journal bestseller list, set Kickstarter funding records, and create viral product launches that have turned into predictable revenue streams. So lots and lots of case studies that you can find at tommorcus.com. If you're curious, just go to tommorcus.com slash about, and that'll get you started. Most importantly, this system is one that 100K Academy members and alumni have used to achieve tremendous results, like Alexa, who used it to have her most profitable year ever, or Tina, who used it to make five figures from a sales funnel that she can now replicate and scale, and that's exactly what she's doing, or Carrie, who made over $75,000 in just seven days. And the crazy part about his story was that his online business was actually a side hustle up until that first profitable launch, which he has then been able to grow and scale. And he subsequently quit his job following that very successful week. And I think that that has been just a game changer for Carrie and the life he's living and the work he gets to do and the impact he gets to make on the world because of the great work he's doing now, because he was able to figure out a system that would get him the targeted traffic, the subscribers, the sales to grow a profitable online business. Bottom line, if you want to grow your online business from six to seven figures, but you flatlined or you're struggling, or you just want to be told what to do and when to do it and in what order, right? And you want a system that is predictable and scalable and isn't just you know another shiny penny, but actually will fit right into your business. It plugs in and is something that you can truly grow. I want you to go to tommorcus.com slash academy. That's tommorcus.com slash academy. Academy is spelled A-C-A-D-E-M-Y. Go to tommorcus.com slash academy, and you'll find a page on my website with more details about 100K Academy, the business mastermind coaching program I run, as well as instructions on what to do next. Again, that's tommorcus.com slash academy. And if you're serious about growing your reach, influence, or profit, just follow the instructions and we'll be in touch, okay? Again, tommorcus.com slash academy. Go ahead and head over there now. 